I'll meet the rest of you soon. I'm going to moderate, so when there's about a minute left, I'll get the hook and pull you off the stage. But try to, you know, we're, we're tight. We have to have the, the meet, sectional meeting after this, so um, try to stick to your 15 minutes so that everybody gets their um, allotment of time, and then we can kind of go things in uh, at 5 when we're finished here. So our first talk is actually a student in my lab, William Choka, and he will be giving you a talk. Oh, and we also don't have a clicker, so you either have to have someone change the slides for you or stand here and do <coughs> them for yourself. I have a clicker. Do you want to use it? Will it work for this? Sure. Everybody can use it. I don't know how to work. It's a USB. Work. You click on this thing and you plug the USB in there. Well, that's, well, if this works, that's great. That's why I bought it. My name is William Chalka. Um, for the past uh, year and a half now, I've been working on the plant biology of the plant family Podophthalmaceae. And so in recent years, there have been several studies by Rupal himself, um, Tipri and Coy, that have tried to help resolve relationships between members of the plant family Podophthalmaceae. Um, there, there have been very good results, but of course there are many issues due to the relative difficulty of getting many of the species, such as limited taxa, um, limited molecular study available from the studies. And so we tried to address many of these issues. And so the overall goals of the research is to determine, again, the evolutionary history of the aquatic plant family Thalassomaceae. And what we've done to address that is to add newly collected species, of which we do have nine of them, and new molecular data. And then ultimately we'll test the circumscription of the genera as a result. And so the problem, several species have been never tested in the molecular analyses. And lots of, there are lots of newly collected material available. And one big example is Pedosum flagelliformi. Our collaborators in Brazil recently found this species a year and a half ago in the summer, and it has not been collected since the 1850s, over 160 years ago, when it was first found and described. And so this was a great opportunity to actually do molecular work on this specimen. And so why is this so important? We use phylogeny for several things. We use it to guide the naming process of the plants. And of course it may seem silly to just put it like that, but if there's conflicting names, then there's always going to be arguments about what something is. And whenever there's arguments, then, of course, there's confusion, mayhem, the world will explode. And then we then can use phytology more practically to help understand the biogeographical patterns and morphological evolution of plants. So we can actually see these two physical traits, and then we can actually use the molecular data to understand how this came about. And so there are Hadosomaceae, there are 51 genera and 270 known species within it. It's predominantly tropical, occurring across both the New World in South America and Old World in both Africa and Asia. There is one species that's found temperately in North America. Some of you might know it, it's Pedosomum seratophyllum. It's found in riverways and it's called riverweed around here. <laughs> Um, they are found in fast-moving waterways attached to rocks on rivers and on cliff sides of waterfalls, such as in the bottom right picture. And in the two left picture, are two examples of species. Um, they have a lot of morphological diversity, appearing in like the top left as plants you might normally think of in waterways, such as almost like seaweeds. But in the bottom left, you see what kind of diversity is available. It looks almost like a lichen the stringy plant design attached to rocks. And those little buds that you see right there are actually its flowers because they are all angiosperms, which is what makes these so unique. And 
they are of conservation concern because as many of them are in these tropical regions, their main source of electricity in these developing regions such as Brazil are from water, hydroelectric damming. But in order for damming to occur, many of these plants, they have a very unique reproductive cycle where they grow and develop when the tides are high and then when the tides recede, they go to flower and then release the seeds. But if there's no recession of water due to damming for electricity, then they're never going to have these flowers, they're never going to release seeds. And so they, they are of great concern in these areas. And so for how we went about collecting our data of these methods. So we did collect data from the previous studies, such as Rupal et al. and Tiffany et al. And then we did gather new plastic data from the MATK gene, the NDHF gene, and the RBCL gene, which were all the chloroplast genes. We did DNA extraction, PCR reactions. We aligned them. We did the alignments using the pro on the program Genius, and then we did eye alignments using the clay. Then we did partition the alignments using a program to avoid any human error, and then we analyzed the data using maximum likelihood. And then for the new data, as I said before, there were previous unsampled species. Alpinaja pilger, again, Pedosum plagioforme, which again we haven't seen in over 160 years, which was collected a year and a half ago. And then seven undescribed species. So those were new additions for us to look at and add. And then for the genes, overall we got 29 new MATK sequences, 39 new NPHF sequences, and 14 new RBLs, RBCL sequences. And the final line at 99 taxon at 2,799 sites. And overall the study represents 34% of Nelson BCI um, species. And so here's the overall phylogeny. It's, it's a bit big, but it, it can be broken down by actually relatively simply with the colors. So this bottom group, which is in green, this is the Trisicoidea subfamily of Pedosomaceae, which it, it does have the strong support as being a clade. Then we have the Wedelna subfamily, which again has the strong support for being a clade. And so these two aren't what the focus of our results are, but it, it's good to know. Then we have our old world clade, which is right here. These are the ones from Africa and Asia. Now, embedded within it, we do have Pedosimum, Felton, Leptinococcus, and Sequoia. These ones are actually found in South America, which is an interesting location, despite being in the predominantly old world clade, which also, again, has this support. And so that, unfortunately, we need, we need more information about why, but that's something we hope to resolve in future studies. And then finally, we do have we need the support that this is the new world clade, and all the species are found in the new world. So then we'll be looking at the old world clade. Unfortunately, though, none of the results are about the old world members, but actually about Pedosum, new world genera found in the old world clade. So in Pedosum, though, we see that it's actually broken up in three separate groups. There's a strong support that these two groups are together, <coughs> while Pedosum flagelliformi, the species found 160 years ago, is actually found all the way up here, which is up in the old world section, and not, or sorry, the new world section, not the old world section. <coughs> And then there's this group, which is divided into this group. There's not a bunch of strong support in here, because these are both very low supporting bootstrap values. However, keep these three groups in mind as we look at the biogeographical data. Here we have the thousand of forming all on its own in northern Brazil. Down here we have the first grouping in southern Brazil altogether. And then up here we have the second grouping that's in the old world clade. All of them are together in North America with one finding in Northern um, South America. Which is interesting because the biogeographical data does again match up with the molecular data. Even though the molecular data doesn't have strong support yet, hopefully in the future studies we can resolve some of this. And then the polymorphology again supports some of the data about why Pedosum flagelliformi isn't um, related 
into the rest of Codoxinum. Here we see that all members of Codoxinum within the golden oak plate have these dyad pollens, while Codoxinum flagelliformi only has a monad pollen. And so that's just another morphological piece of data that supports this claim. And then another um, result from the study was from the New World tree. And so this is for Rhinkalacus. Unfortunately, we haven't done as much research on the biogeographical or the morphological data, something I hope to do in the future. But as you can see, Rhinkalacus has been broken up into several spots. And there, there's strong support for these groupings, but we don't have too great a support in the backbone, which again is a problem for most of the backbone in both the old world and the new world, something I hope we can resolve with in the future. But Rhinkalacus, there's one species that's related to Autonoma, one species that's related to Wetsamola, one species that's related to Macarania, and then these two happen to actually be related to each other. So hopefully we can find out what's going on here. Are all of these Rhinkalacus? Are none of these Rhinkalacus? Hopefully that once I can actually study biogeographical, molecular, and morphological, we can find out further results. And so then just an overview of the conclusions. Pedosum is definitely not monophyletic. The Pedosum flagelliformi is an early diverging member of the subfamily Pedosomoidae. And then as for the remainder of the Pedosum family, is it monophyletic at the moment? We can't determine from the molecular data. We need more evidence. Um, at the moment, some of them only have MATK data, while we need more NDHF and RBCL data, possibly other genes if need be. And then Rhinkalacus is not monophyletic because, again, various lineages are associated with the three gene genera that I listed before. And so some taxonomic changes are needed. And so for the future of the project, we need to complete a full chloroplast genome sequencing for, to address the deep relationships along the backbone and then increase the taxon sampling. And so I'd just like to thank Kaiv and Epstor for her help in the lab and the funding that she brought with her. Um, I'd like to thank the KU Honors Program and the Biology Department for their funding and support. And I'd like to thank Dr. Brad Rubel for his help and guidance and basically teaching me everything I know about research biology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to you yeah. Does anybody have a question for, for William? Well, I had a very general question. I'm okay. sorry. I've been reading um, Zander's papers recently about monophyly and phytoneuron. What is wrong with paraphyly as displayed by cladists? <laughs> is there something wrong with paraphyly? Can we, do we have to reject it all, all the time? In terms of what? In terms of taxonomy? Of being an acceptable pattern for clavis display. Do we always have to look for monophyly patterns displayed by clavis? For taxonomy? Or, yeah. or what? Yeah, for taxonomy in general. How well, strong is paraphyly? In my opinion, I guess it goes back to Oakham's reason. You always want like the simplest explanation possible. And then if there's paraphyly, then there's something more complex going on than previously explained. Well, this is a pretty complicated topic. More we'll, we'll get Alexi started here. Um, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to talk about evolutionary units, paraphyletic group is not an evolutionary unit. So that's the simplest explanation. If you want your taxonomy to be an evolutionary unit, then monophyly is the way to go, and paraphyly is not. If you're not trying to have evolution or taxonomy represent an evolutionary unit, then paraphyly is okay. It depends on what your question is. So we'll have Alexi. Thank you very much, William. Uh, we'll have.